Thank you for joining us for the Science Communication Workshop on Translating Marine Science into Effective Outreach, delivered by Sashinta and Melanie from Diversity of Nature. We're honored to have students and early career researchers join us for the annual training meeting across Turtle Island on what is currently known as North America. We also have folks joining from Australia, Nigeria, China, and Scotland. I'm Alexa Given for those who don't know me, and I'm Mio Par's training program manager. I use she, they pronouns, and I will be hosting today's session from Kijibuktuk in Mi'kma'ki, modernly known as Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's of utmost importance to understand the origins of the land in which we occupy space, our history and relationship to that land. Mio Par is hosted at Dahousie University in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the peace, uh, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples signed in 1726. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of the lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. As we begin, we would like to acknowledge that we are living and working on the unceded and traditional lands of Indigenous peoples, whose ongoing historical relationships with this land continue to this day. We are all treaty people and are responsible for not only upholding, but advancing reconciliation. It's now my pleasure to introduce our facilitators, Sashinta and Melanie from Diversity of Nature, a scientific outreach organization run by BIPOC graduate students at the Housie University that are dedicated to in increasing BIPOC representation in the natural sciences. We'll add a link to their website in the chat if you'd like to learn more. Sashinta is a co-founder of Diversity of Nature as I mentioned, um, Diversity of Nature is a science outreach initiative that provides cost-free and immersive programming to underrepresented youth across Nova Scotia. Through Diversity of Nature, she's gained extensive experience in science outreach and mentorship. In addition, Sashinta has lectured undergraduate biology courses as a part-time faculty member at St. Mary's University, instructed a marine mammal field camp for grade 9 to 12 at SMU, and has been a teaching assistant for over 10 plus courses in science communication. She's mentored undergrad students through directed research projects and is currently mentoring two BIPOC undergraduates. She successfully created and implemented science workshop for high school students across Nova Scotia, reaching 300 plus students to date. Melanie uses she, her pronouns and is a co-founder of Diversity of Nature as well. Through this work, she's gained extensive experience in science outreach and program development. Melanie's been working in science outreach for over six years with both children and adult learners. She's worked with private groups like the Mad Science Program and nonprofits like the Canadian Association for Girls in Science and Wise Atlantic, uh, groups uh, that work for developing workshops um, as a developer and demonstrator. She's also freelance as a science promoter, giving public lectures and workshops in numerous Ontario elementary schools, naturalist groups, and public libraries. She's worked in institutional learning roles as a university faculty and in numerous teaching assistant positions as well, and continues to work part-time as a high school biology teacher, giving her extensive insight into students' science and curriculum needs. It's an absolute honor to have you both here with us today. Over to you. Well, thank you so much for having us, and we're really excited to talk to you guys today. So we're going to be talking a little bit about how we can effectively translate marine science into effective outreach. And by our turnout, I think it's pretty clear that scientists and other early career people are looking for ways to kind of bridge that gap between academia and science and the community. So we're really excited to kind of get this discourse going. Next slide. So one of the main tips I have for effective scientific outreach is actually to try to connect with your audience. So I'm going to start off by following this advice to try and then tell you guys a little bit about us. So as Alexa mentioned, me and Melanie are both third year PhD students at Dalhousie University. And we really lucked out because we very much are enjoying our research project as well as our mentors. So for me, I'm looking at quantitative ecology, specifically looking to see how we can answer cause and effect relationships based on observational data and I'm trying to answer these questions, particularly within applied conservation issues around coral reefs. And I'll just give it off to Melanie for a second to introduce what she's into before moving on. 
Thanks. Yeah, so um, I use experimental biology in my PhD research to investigate how fish respond to climate change through a process called plasticity. So that occurs within their own lifetimes. And um, maybe I'll tell you a little bit what I, about what I'm finding so far. It seems like plasticity is actually helping them cope with some of these negative effects of climate change. So really enjoying it. And Next let's slide. So as I said, we're very lucky that we're really enjoying the research that we do. And but this is not the only aspect of the science that we're into. So we've always been very involved in teaching. So in the past, as Alexa mentioned, we've taken on teaching roles both within universities and within high schools and have communicated with scientific outreach across various ages. And really in early 2020, when we were having national discourse about how to increase equity in our society, and for us in particular, how to increase equity of racialized people within the sciences, me and Melanie started wondering, well, what could we do in our relative positions of privilege to increase equity within our old field of ecology and evolutionary biology? And we were actually taking a long walk in Wolfville with our dogs and our partners, completely ignoring the dogs and partners. And we started to go on this discourse of what, well, what can we do? And we came up with this idea, next slide, of diversity of nature. So at this time during this week, we thought what this would be, we were really excited by the name diversity of nature. It sounded really cool. And our original plan was to do an annual overnight field expedition at the Harrison Lewis Discovery Center, where essentially we would take about 15 BIPOC youth across Nova Scotia and give them cost-free immersive field experiences. And the reason we came to this is because when we were reflecting on our own careers, we realized that some of the more fulfilling things we've been able to do, so for example, field work, we were often the only people of color there. And oftentimes these fulfilling experiences were very cost prohibitive. So it actually prevented us sometimes from taking on these roles. So we wanted to kind of bridge that gap. And so we got really invested in trying to create this organization. So there was like a lot of passion and time commitment that went into it. But more than that, we received an outpour of support both from academic institutions such as Dalhousie University, as well as community members, so teachers and students and parents themselves. And so this over the year has really resulted in diversity of nature expanding. So now we are an effective BIPOC focused scientific outreach program associated with Dalhousie University. We provide cost-free day camps, overnight field expeditions, as well as community workshops in the natural sciences. And so far we've actually reached over 300 BIPOC youth. And several of these participants have repeatedly come to following workshops. So it's allowed us to kind of really build a community and connection with these students. And we make a point in our lessons to highlight diverse perspectives in science. And these are often led by diverse scientists themselves. So for example, highlighting the importance of indigenous ecology in doing conservation work. We provide ongoing mentorship from BIPOC early career scientists to really show these kids that they can see themselves reflected in leadership positions. And we provide various scholarships throughout the year for BIPOC students that go into post-secondary education just to kind of give them that incentive to kind of stop that leaky pipeline. Next slide. So that's a bit about us and what we do and our experience in scientific outreach. And now I'm gonna head it off to Melanie to talk about what to, how to actually do it. Great, thanks. So just to get started, um, let's chat a bit about scientific outreach and what we're all heading out to accomplish here when we do scientific outreach. So basically the goal here is to connect members of the scientific community, like uh, the vast majority of people in this talk to the greater public. And this is accomplished through the sharing of knowledge, um, whether it be in the form of something very straightforward, like a public lecture or more interactive activities like school visits, hands-on activities, and even workshops where various skills are shared with the public. And this results in a lot of benefits for the public. So what we really hope to do is to increase scientific literacy and help the public have a good and solid understanding of the science going on in the world around them. But also one of the important purposes of science, science out, outreach is to inspire the public. So we really want to um, encourage 
especially young people to get involved in STEM careers, but we also want to give people the tools that they need to actually start asking questions about the world around them and to promote that natural curiosity that a lot of people have about the world around them. Um, and importantly, because many of us work in, well, th this is specifically for marine science and in marine science, we have um, a really great opportunity here to do science outreach because marine science is just so naturally interesting um, to people in the world. But not only that, we have an opportunity to share our passion for things like conservation and um, other elements of science that lead to positive social changes, not only for the field of science and the field of marine conservation and biology, but for the world itself. Now, one of the things that Suchint and I have learned as we've been doing more and more science outreach is that there are also reciprocal benefits. So in performing science outreach and connecting with the public through knowledge, uh, we found that we've actually received a lot of benefits. So we've developed informal venues for science dissemination where we can practice our public speaking and practice the discussions that we have even about our own research. And we've also developed a really strong connection to the community around us. And we all know that science doesn't occur in a bubble. We have a community that we connect with. We have uh, funders from the public. And just having a reminder of those connections is incredibly beneficial to the way that we do science. Um, and Suchint and I can definitely both attest to the fact that our PhD experience has been enriched through connecting um, with the greater community around us. So the majority of this talk is going to focus on adapting content. And what we mean by that is essentially taking um, science, which can feel or sound very complex, full of jargon, and difficult to interpret data at first, and then essentially turning that into something that's understandable, palatable, and even engaging for the public to participate in. So we have another set of poll questions. Um, Oops. So I think these were just the, like we already set this in the beginning, so we can just kind of go through what everyone is into. I, I thought we had a second set. Here we go. Um, this is just, this is just to get to know what people are interested in, in terms of their outreach. So I've just launched that. Can everyone see it? And here we just kind of want to get to know um, who you're interested in doing outreach with. That's interesting. A lot of people are interested in outreach for adults. Interesting. So it's all across the board. Great. Okay. So we have a lot of people here interested in doing outreach with um, especially adults and all ages, groups, and families. We do talk about youth a lot in this presentation, but the good news is that Sometimes uh, young people can be uh, even harder to work with than adults. And so all of the tips and tricks that we suggest here can absolutely apply to adults to make that experience more engaging for them. Um, and there's also a large, uh, a large range in experience uh, that people are interested in working with. So that's very interesting to see as well. All right, great. So I'll just move on from that now and get into this adapting content. So Suchint and I spent a bit of time uh, discussing how we approach adapting content and what our strategies are. And we sort of came up with this idea of three key guiding questions that can help you um, focus on how you're going to adapt your content. So just to start with, um, ask yourself, what is your expertise? What are the topics that you wish to share with the public and what will you focus on? And then just as an addendum to this question, you also want to think about how your topic of interest can be more broadly generalized to the public. Um, so often when we're speaking to the public, uh, it may be difficult them to conceptualize of uh, a very specific scientific concept such as temperature dependent sex determination in turtles. But if you start off by sort of generalizing with something very broad like turtle conservation, this is a great way to get them really engaged and interested. So think about your topic and think about some of the overarching themes behind that topic as well. Um, next, and very importantly, you want to ask yourself who your audience is, because this can really modulate the way that you approach your outreach. 
Um, so how old are they and what is their comprehension level? I know many of you are interested in working with adults who may have uh, quite a good knowledge base of the topics that you're discussing. So for example, a retiree group that dabble in conservation may have a really solid background for you to get into some of that more detailed information. But if you're working with kindergarten children, you might want to start off with the basics. Um, this can also influence what format of outreach is best for your audience. So as people who work in academia, I'm sure many of us are familiar with um, giving a 12 minute presentation with three minute questions, but there are other ways to approach outreach. So this could be interactive and hands on activities. It could also be exploratory where participants are invited to um, see and touch and explore the material themselves. And last, uh, think of the context of your outreach activity. So we all have limitations and constraints in the way that we can approach the material. This could mean the budget, um, how much money per participant you're able to, to, to spend, or even the location, perhaps you have to do it in a certain venue. Um, and also think about the timing of this event. So the duration, the itinerary, even the date that it's set on may influence who you're able to reach. So um, I know this is somewhat abstract and what we'll do is Suchinta is actually going to describe two case studies of outreach activities that we've done that sort of walk through these questions. So I'll pass it off to Suchinta. Thanks, Melanie. All right, so these are by workshop leaders that came into Diversity of Nature, and we gave them complete autonomy to support their workshop as they saw fit. So our first one is Hunter Stevens, who at the time was a master's student in marine biology at Dalhousie University. And when it comes to his expertise, it's really in at being a naturalist. So he's out every weekend taking cool shots of different organisms, both in the water and outside of the water. And we're always like, what is that hunter? And he always knows the answer. So he's very much in the zone when he's out and about. And he also has these technical skills such as snorkeling, scuba diving, and outdoor adventure. And he approached us because he really wanted to give students that otherwise might not have privilege to these expensive outdoor experiences. Because as he said, he grew up very privileged and his parents always offered him these experiences and that really allowed him to understand that this is what he loved and then pursue a career in marine science and he really just wanted to pay that forward. So he wanted to focus his audience on BIPOC high school students. So he knew that they would have medium familiarity with scientific content. So they are likely taking science courses and biology courses in grade 10, 11 and 12, for example. He really wanted to emphasize a hands-on activity because he knew that that is the most experiential type of learning, especially when it comes to something like marine ecology. And he also wanted to be sensitive towards the needs of the demographic. So he wanted to make sure that his teaching and his lessons were inclusive. And the context that he was dealing with, it was summer in Halifax and he had a $1,000 budget because he had applied to an NSERC student ambassador grant, which pays workshop leaders $1,000 to basically carry out their own scientific workshops. Next slide. So what he came up with was amazing. It was one of the highlights of four diversity of nature so far. So he came up with a two day introduction to snorkeling workshop. So the first day he sat the kids down and he showed them how to put on their gear and he fitted them and he talked a lot about safety. So what to do, what not to do, what they're expected to see and who they can count on if they need, if they need help underwater. And this is really critical because all of these students, this was the first time they were going out snorkeling. So you really want to make sure that you have that safety talk with them. And again, all of this was cost free to the students who were very much enthusiastic. And then on the second day, we just took them to Polly's Cove. So none of these students have ever done snorkeling and we just threw them in the ocean. They were well prepared and we, we watched them very carefully and they had a great time. So you can see some pictures here. They found some really cool critters. And I think all of them, some of them came up to us later and said it was the highlight of their summer. So that was really great to see. So we'll give another example next. So this one's a bit different. Uh, so this was led by Erin Judah, who is actually a third year undergrad in marine science at Dalhousie University, although you'll never know it because he's very exceptional at what he does. And when it comes to his expertise, he's really interested in marine ecology. And he recently took a course on fish form and function. So he was like really interested in that when he approached us. 
And he was also doing a lot of like live Instagram dissections of fish for his friends. So I thought, why don't you do this for some kids? I think that'll be fun. And he really gravitated towards that idea. So he chose an audience of BIPOC high school students because he really wanted to touch on some of the stuff he's learned about fish form and function. And he thought that would be a good audience to kind of do that with. And given that he wanted to both teach them about theory as well as doing dissections, the context was really that he wanted to do a mini lecture followed by an activity. And so we recommended that he rent a room at the Discovery Center and we gave him a budget of $800. So let's see what he came up with. Next slide. So he did exactly what he wanted. He gave, first of all, a very interactive and enthusiastic lecture on fish form and function. Melanie and I definitely learned a lot from this. And what was really interesting was just his love and passion for the topic really came through and got everyone else in the room very excited. So for anyone that's doing passive learning, such as lecture-based, I think one of the main advice we can give you is just like, just be enthusiastic and that'll come through. And following this lecture, he did a really cool like hands on activity where he got uh, every student to pick a fish of their choice and dissect them. And this was really cool because that week, Melanie and I actually went to a local fisherman to get some bycatch of all these different various fishes. And so it really connected kind of like a local community feel to what the students were doing. And so they all chose different fishes. Some of them chose a squid. And what was interesting was that because it was student centered, they all ended up doing different things. So some of them, like this person pic pictured here, was kind of interested in the general like anatomy of the fish. Whereas like some kids were really interested in finding all the parasites, which I found a little off-putting that they were into it. And others were just really into the eye. Like they spent the whole time kind of checking out the eye of the fish. So that was overall a really fun event. So these are kind of two very different examples of marine science outreach. So I'm gonna hand it back to Melanie now for some more tips and tricks. Thanks, yeah. And so I just wanted to go over, or we wanted to go over a few tips and tricks um, based on a lot of questions that we get from people who work with us and other uh, members of the community who participate in outreach. And one of the big questions we're often asked is how do I format my outreach event? Um, how do I, you know, go about structuring where I present my material? And one uh, very easy way to accomplish this is through an hourglass model. So you might have heard about this uh, for writing, say, persuasive essays or even scientific reports. This model actually also applies really well to outreach activities or lectures. So um, start with a broad introduction. Basically, you want to follow this broad to narrow and then broad again format. Um, in this introduction, it's always great to introduce yourself, trying to connect with the audience. Um, and then you want to present some of the background information. So the foundational um, background that they need to know in order to understand the problem and then outline why this issue is important. So really here in this introduction, you're kind of building up tension for the audience to then understand um, some of the more detailed information which you'll then sort of zone in on in the middle of your outreach event. Um, this is a great opportunity to zero in on more complex scientific issues or details um, in the format of an activity. This could be where the students or participants get really hands-on with the material. And then importantly, at the end of it, it's really good to try to connect what the audience learned to the broader significance. Um, people are often interested in understanding how the material they learned affects bigger questions like entire ecosystems or society. Um, it's great to have a follow-up chat to kind of rehash all of this information. What we like to do is actually uh, do a bit of trivia and ask students or participants um, questions about what they learned just to reinforce that material. And also um, audience members typically ask how they can get involved at the end. So it's always great to have a couple of suggestions for how people can actually um, get involved with this issue. I've had people um, write letters to their MP or MPP after seeing an event um, or even get involved with conservation outreach or volunteering themselves.
Um, some more tips and tricks here. So we are also often asked, how do we talk about really complex or difficult scientific concepts? And these are just two um, really short and easy tips that you can use. One of them is the use of an analogical model. So this is a fancy way of just saying, use an analogy. And we definitely recommend connecting this analogy to humans. So as an example, I mentioned that I study plasticity, which can be kind of an an abstract concept. It's essentially how the environment can affect the phenotype of an organism throughout its lifetime. And those terms are very jargony and somewhat abstract. I work on fish, so maybe this doesn't have a lot of relevance to people's daily lives. But if you rephrase this in the context of something that is very common and personal, um, for example, an athlete, you could say, well, if someone's a gymnast or an athlete when they're very young, as they get older, they may have an increased muscle mass or maybe denser bones, or perhaps they're more flexible. And so by using an analogy for plasticity, you can really clearly show how this process works. And I'll give this example to Suchinta. Oh, you're on mute. It's tip number 10, don't be on mute when you're doing online scientific outreach. Uh, so another great thing you can do is use pictures. I'm sure we've all done this before. So here's just an example from the coral reef world. So when it comes to explaining coral bleaching, there is a common misconception that when a coral bleaches and they turn white, that they're dead. So, and this is not entirely true. So this kind of just shows what the different stages are. So it's showing that one of the things that could lead to coral bleaching, which is when that mutualistic algae leaves the coral, happens when you have increased water temperature. So you're going from a healthy coral to a bleached coral, but this bleached coral isn't dead, but it is more susceptible to dying. And if that water continues to stay warm or increases even more, this can then lead to a dead coral. So this picture in itself is helping in kind of explain that more complex relationship. And it's also showing that a bleached coral can in turn return back to a healthy coral state if the conditions recover and cool down. So without this picture, what I said probably would have made much less sense. So pictures are always a great way to communicate things. And you can absolutely leverage pictures that are made by people on the internet who are much more skilled at creating images than uh, yourself, for example. So it's very easy to use these uh, imagery to explain concepts. And uh, last here, some few scattered tips and tricks. Um, one is to ask your audience questions and keep things open-ended. As Suchinta mentioned, Aaron Judah did this during his uh, lecture component to his activity. So rather than asking yes, no questions though, it's really important to try to ask the audience questions that gets them to think and to build on foundational knowledge. So you may not want to you know, go for a walk in um, a salt marsh and ask, is this a biodiverse area, yes or no? Instead, you might wanna ask them something like, why do you think this is biodiverse? Or why is this area important? Um, another tip here is to incorporate games and competitions. Suchinta does this a lot and the participants really love it. So adding a little element of competition, for example, who can identify the most fungi while we're out um, is a great way to get people really engaged. And you can even consider handing out little prizes like stickers. Um, another thing you can incorporate into your outreach, especially if you're doing something uh, more lecture oriented, is to still have a little bit of an interactive element. You could use a prop to help explain what you're talking about or even just to give the audience um, more of a feel or a sight or a smell for what they're learning about. So for example, sometimes when I talk about turtles, I'll bring little ping pong balls to give the audience a feel for what a turtle egg actually looks and feels like. Um, you can also consider giving your audience members uh, take homes. This could even be just a sheet of paper with some interesting facts on it or things they can follow up with, or it could um, go all the way to a slightly more expensive item like a fold scope where someone could take that home and then continue to explore the material on their own or sh even share it with their loved ones. And uh, very last but certainly not least, it's always important to try to connect 
what your material is and what you're talking about to the lived experience of your audience members. So um, Aaron Judah did that with his activity where we used local bycatch to build that connection between um, people who live in the Halifax Regional Mun Municipality and the fish that live in the ecosystem around us. But it could be something as simple as just using examples that connect with your audience. So we often work with Black, Indigenous, and people of color youth. And what we like to do is rather than using um, more common or stereotypical examples of scientists, we'll bring in scientists who reflect our actual audience and allow them to see themselves um, in that scientific sphere. So just as an example here, um, Katherine Johnson, an African-American mathematician who worked with NASA, may be a more appropriate example and a more inspiring example to certain audiences than someone more commonly used like Neil Armstrong. And so now that we've um, kind of given everyone this big rundown on some of the tips and tricks we use to, to create our outreach activities, we thought it would be fun to uh, do a little bit of a group activity. So we'll use that breakout room function. And in this activity, we'll get you guys to think about an outreach activity. So this is a hypothetical outreach activity. You can make it as realistic to your own scenario as you'd like, or you can uh, go wild with it and have like a really big budget or something. Um, basically just start by discussing a topic and then think about all of the different factors that can go into it to make it an effective outreach um, activity. So once we're done that, we'll have everyone um, or a few people maybe pitch their ideas. Here we go. So we just have a few more things to chat about. So some of the logistics stuff, which is um, less fun, but it's definitely things that need to be considered for outreach activities, even for simple lectures, um, as well as some other important considerations. And Suchinta is going to start us off with that. Awesome. Yeah. So as Melanie said, we're going to dive into logistics planning. And this is a really good time because you guys have gotten on your groups and you have these amazing ideas. And so now the next step is, OK, how can we actually make this a reality? And there are a few things that we do have to think about. Next slide. So the first is funding. So how do you actually pay for this event and what money is needed? So there's, it, de it really depends on how extensive your outreach is. So let's start with the softer one. So if you're just getting into scientific outreach, I recommend partnering with other scientific organizations. So for example, a very fulfilling one is Skype a Scientist. This is something I actually did last week, where essentially they will pair you up with a classroom that would benefit from your expertise. So when I was signing up for it, I said my expertise was in marine ecology as well as conservation. And they paired me up with an advanced eight grade class all the way in Texas. And I really didn't know what to expect, but everyone was great. The kids were brilliant and it was super interactive and the teacher and the kids all seemed to get a lot out of it as well as I. So if you're just trying to tip your toes in the water that I definitely recommend Skype the Scientist. And this of course wouldn't cost you any money. You can also partner with organizations such as ourselves, so Diversity of Nature. So if you are especially an underrepresented early career scholar, we are open to you coming in and we will give you complete autonomy over the workshop that you do and we will compensate you for your time as well. And I have a few other suggestions here that I've run into from other organizations that you could potentially work with. But this list is, of course, massive, and you have to do your own homework to see where you best fit in. So for example, you could volunteer with the Dalhousie Bird Society. You could possibly work with Imhotep Legacy Academy, Wise Atlantic, and Supernova, who do scientific outreach in the Atlantic region. And they will likely give you prescribed roles. So if you're especially beginning and you're a little bit nervous about creating your own workshop, those could be a good avenue for that. So if you want to take more of a lead and kind of run your own independent one-off workshops, then a great way to do this is through the NSERC Student Ambassador Program. So as I mentioned, Hunter Stevens, who put together that snorkeling event, did it through that. And they'll essentially give you, if you win the application, $1,000 to kind of run your workshop. And so I actually did one last month where I took some people from the Dalhousie Bird Society as well as a bunch of BIPOC youth and we went along a walk on the Salt Marsh Trail and I gave them all binoculars and free food and we spent the whole day looking at the diversity of birds and learning about the importance of salt marshes. So that was a lot of fun. 
it's also a great place here because there's a lot of outdoor adventure and fun that you can actually hold frugal scientific outreach. Something as simple as a nature walk could be very conducive to scientific learning and might not cost you any money at all. You can also borrow equipment from your institutions. So we often borrow equipment from Dalhousie biology department and they're happy to lend it to us. So just like kind of being strategic about your mutualistic relationships with people with more money sometimes helps. Uh, and you can also ask for free hosting at different venues. So an example of this is we often host for free at the Halifax Public Library, as well as the Natural History Museum here within Grayson. And another hint is to always be opportunistic. So for example, I've been asking around at private sectors and a lot of them have been receptive. So for example, we got a grant from Clearwater Cares. And if you're really feeling ambitious, which I hope you are, you can also start your own outreach initiative. And this might seem scary and kind of beyond what you can do, but I think it feels that way for anyone that wants to start their own outreach initiative. It definitely did for me and Melanie, but we did it. And there's just such a need for it that I think, you know, the support will be there and you'll get a lot of meaning out of it. And if that doesn't convince you, one of our students who is 14 years old actually started her own outreach initiative and it's called the Afro-Indigenous Book Club and she is doing an amazing job with it. So just this month, we supported it by buying their book of the month, which was The Skin We're In. And she actually went out and got the author, Desmond Cole, to show up and talk to all of the kids. So if she can do it, you guys can definitely do it as well. Next slide. Okay, so one of the things that um, we were kind of warned about when we first started was that it may sometimes be difficult to get participants to uh, join in or engage. Um, luckily, this hasn't actually been the case, but we think that there are some strategies we've used that have sort of uh, mitigated that worry. So one of them is having a home base for our initiative. Um, right when we um, started the idea for diversity of nature, we made a website right away, and this was a great way for us to sort of chronicle our own ideas about it. But importantly, it was a place in which members of the community, teachers, and other folks who were interested in either participating or partnering with with us could get in touch with us. So it's really important to just have a way um, to connect with the community and for them to see what you're all about. Um, we also have heavily used social media for advertisements. And this is especially true um, kind of with COVID happening. We had a lot of online events and we found that social media was a wonderful venue to share some of the events that we were hosting. And um, it led to pretty good turnout. So Facebook and Instagram are, are obviously great. Um, a lot of people will sort of follow Facebook groups for outreach, but Twitter has actually been instrumental in ensuring that we get in touch with the community. There's plenty of community leaders um, out there on face, uh, sorry, on, on Twitter, such as teachers from various schools um, who are really helpful in disseminating uh, advertisements to their connections. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind is advertisements. And we think that this has really helped uh, with our ability to attract participants to outreach events. So we try to use a lot of imagery and this imagery can sometimes give an idea to the participants of what to expect. So for example, in this Instagram ad, um, we used little illustrations of fish and this kind of conveyed A, that it was about fish, but also B, that it was intended for a bit of a younger audience. So this was aimed at high school age children. Whereas in this ad, uh, which we made for Twitter, we used a little bit more of um, a mature professional layout. We had an image of Unity Cooper, the workshop leader who led this event, just to kind of create a personal touch. So all of these um, little aesthetic components, I think, did really help in attracting people. Um, so definitely think about making posters and advertisements for your event to ensure that you get good turnout. Um, and last but not least here um, for registration, we tried as much as possible to get people to register ahead of time. This was important for our logistics planning to ensure that we had, you know, the right amount of materials or the right amount of food for our participants. Um, also, it's a great way to just get their, uh, their info to connect with them and give them a reminder before the event or even to follow up. 
And so um, to kind of follow all of that, we also have recently been developing uh, real life connections, especially as things have been opening up and we've been working more directly with people. And as I mentioned, it's really important to make yourself reachable. So whether it's through your personal website or your organization's website, um, social media, or having an email available online, we found that a lot of members of the community were actually reaching out to us first. And so this may happen to you. Um, I'm sure it's happened to Sachinta, and it certainly happened to me even before Diversity of Nature. Sometimes a member of the public would see my website and say, oh, I would love for you to talk about turtles with like my students. So have, um, have those connections open for people to reach you with. Um, and just as an example, through some of these uh, connections where we've been in touch with members of the community, uh, we've made some really great and long lasting uh, partnerships. So um, this woman pictured here, Afalake Awayiga, is one of the leaders of Generation One Leadership Initiative, which is a Pan-African uh, Outreach Association in Halifax. And we have partnered with her a lot. Um, and not only is this important for getting in touch with communities that we want to reach, but also it's important for having someone who can explain to us what their community wants. So let us know that there's a lot of um, people out there who want to do family events, not just for youth, but for parents to actually spend meaningful time with their children. And so taking this into account, we ended up modifying our programming a little bit. So definitely important to get in touch with uh, members of the community and community leaders who have a really good understanding of what their communities want. Um, also, you can go ahead and advertise in uh, real life spaces now, um, places like libraries, uh, churches or museums, or even coffee shops. Um, we haven't played around with this too much, but it is, um, you know, a good form of advertisement. And last uh, but not least here, it's also important to follow up with your participants. So especially if you're planning on doing more than one event, um, we find that some participants are coming back again and again. And this is really fantastic because you're actually able to see this like snowballing positive impact that you have on your participants and build these relationships with your participants themselves. Um, it also gives you the ability to ask the community um, to tell you what they want and what they are interested in participating in. So we reached out to Leah Kresser from Acadia University, who is a Mi'kmaq ecologist, and she had this great idea to take everyone to the Bedford Barrens, which is something that we would not have thought of ourselves. And here she is pictured here showing all the kids petroglyphs, and she was actually the highlight of the events and the kids came up to us and her later and told us that they found it very inspiring. She talked about Mi'kmaq knowledge, she connected like all of these relevant teachings that weren't given attention in the scientific community. And she also said that recently Western scientists have been figuring it out and only now they're starting to listen because it's been published in papers. So it was really interesting to kind of see like what gets included in the mainstream and what gets excluded. And just having her talk was really inspirational because as a first year undergrad, she actually failed her biology lab and she said it's because she didn't feel connected to it. And she complained and they were like, what do you want changed? And she was like, well, you need to acknowledge indigenous ecology and indigenous knowledge. And she actually, from failing that course, completely revamped that course. And so now any undergrad doing a degree in Acadia has to learn about Mi'kmaq knowledge when taking a first year biology course. So I think that was really inspiring for the kids to see that as an early career or young scholar, your voice can be heard. And of course, when you're working with underrepresented leaders, you do want to make sure that their time is valued. So we make a point to compensate our workers. You want to also connect participants with future resources. So for example, if there are any equity serving scholarships to kind of just send off emails. So for example, we, Nature Nova Scotia is currently looking for a BIPOC naturalist. And so I sent that off to all of our students to see if anyone would be interested in that kind of a job. So always just think of the long-term benefits that they can gain. And last but not least, you want to be open and receptive to community feedback, which is something that Melanie touched on earlier, as well as commit to ongoing education and accountability. So these are some tips that we actually recently published on 
10 simple rules paper that we're actually linking to you guys either currently or later. So watch out for that. I think that. it was sent out. <laughs> okay, awesome. And next slide. Okay, so we want to end off with personal benefits of doing scientific outreach. So for me personally, the overwhelming benefit is that it adds immense value to my scientific journey. So often we'll hear, uh, you know, don't focus too much on the scientific outreach, you know, it'll take away from your publication record or so on. And what we found is the opposite. It actually gives us energy and joy and meaning in our long term journey. So we're not, we're actually more motivated to do that other side of work. And it actually increases the relevance of that work. And it kind of like both feed off each other. So I think it is a really good balance. And another benefit, of course, is that you get to create these lasting relationships with your colleagues and mentees. So Melanie is now my best friend. We're going to be like partners forever, it's always doing science together. And that really came about through diversity of nature, for example. And of course, you're gaining a lot of communication and leadership skills. And so this will help you build your network. So a lot of the research opportunities that I have coming up are from professors who've heard of me through diversity of nature. So that's been interesting to see. You're of course, increasing your visibility, you're enhancing your CV. And these are also transferable skills that you're getting. So if you're comfortable or if you get comfortable with science outreach and talking to people and interacting with people, well, the next interview you have, for example, you can have that, you can charm them a little bit more because you'll be more comfortable in those situations. And so we just want to end off with a quote that we got from Dr. Kevin Hewitt, who is a professor at Dalhousie University and also the co-founder of Imhotep Legacy Academy. And it's just interesting because he's been doing this before us and what he says really resonates with how we feel as well. And he said, get involved in your community. It will give back to you many times over what you put in and provide you the support that will lift you up to achieve your goals. So this is coming from someone who's made it. He's a tenure track professor. He has graduate students and he continues to do this scientific outreach. So you can definitely do both and benefit from doing both. So I think we'll end it off with there. If anyone has any questions, we do have a few minutes. Feel free to, uh, you know, turn on your your camera or your microphone if you'd like, but we'll also be scanning the chat. So I think one of the questions I saw earlier, Melanie, was regarding your advertisements. Someone asked, were you hosting <coughs> these live on social media? Um, yeah, so we had some things that were being hosted live on social media. So for example, we worked with uh, Super Supernova to do like a big panel talk that was on Facebook Live, and then it was then recorded and uploaded for posterity. Um, but we also had other things that weren't using social media live. So we had like Zoom workshops. Um, so a combination works great. I think the Facebook Live format worked really well um, to increase the number of viewers, um, but it is harder for participation. I guess I'll ask a question. I'm gonna ask a question to Melanie. How has the outreach that you've done and the teaching that you've done benefited your research? Oh, well, honestly, like being able to explain something to somebody who is not an expert. So let's say a kindergarten kid, if you can convince a kindergarten kid that something is important in science, or if you can explain a, a detailed process to them and they understand it, then you're set. You will be able to walk into that conference with complete confidence. So it's definitely helped me, um, you know, use language better to explain things and work on my ability to actually talk about the knowledge that I'm learning. Awesome. Can I ask a second question? I'm going to keep asking yes. unless other people have questions. I don't want to take up other people's Does anyone questions. Does anyone have any questions that are maybe specific to something that they're trying to do right now, like um, Lisa's sort of touch tank uh, outreach event or anything like that? Awesome. Time for my second question then. Uh, what is the most fulfilling part of scientific outreach for you? 
for me, hmm. It's, I honestly think working with youth is the most fulfilling for me. I know we have a lot of people here focused on um, adult learners, but you'll have moments working with youth that are just like life-changing. Um, so we were working with uh, Leah Cruiser, the Indigenous ecologist, and we had um, a talking circle and the students mentioned how grateful they were, um, you know, to be here and to be experiencing this and how much they've learned. And that just like made me cry. <laughs> I thought it was so beautiful. So working with youth and really seeing them like fall in love with science is so rewarding. What about you, Suchinta? I'd say the same. <laughs> You're second though, after them. <laughs> with you. <laughs> okay well does are there any more questions or comments no thank okay, you well, both so much for delivering such an informative presentation i'm sure that this will be very helpful for folks in developing their own outreach materials and hopefully programs so that they can communicate their science um, is it all right if folks get in touch with you afterwards if they have any questions on great yeah Absolutely. I was actually just Anytime. about to offer that and like feel free to again ask us any questions or for feedback but also especially if you're in the HRM area um, and you do want to try your hand at outreach whether it be a lecture or a hands-on activity you can definitely feel free to get in touch with diversity of nature we're happy to uh, to help you out maybe even provide funding so You guys were a great audience. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. This was great. <clears throat> Excuse me. This was great. Thank you so much. Yay. All right. Okay. I hope everyone has fun at the other uh, MeoPro sessions. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, everyone.